There's also the idea that a lot of African Americans live in homes where, from the time they're seven, their fathers say to them, you know, be a man. Yeah, yeah. So even um, the things that are caught inside of the homes and taught inside of the homes are going to make some of these kids, things that don't seem like they're bad things to say, man up. Yeah, you know, sure. You, uh, in, I, I don't think in many white homes a kid falls, hits his head on a, on a tree, comes home crying, and their father's going to say man up. Man up. Yeah, right, yeah. so yeah. there's that. Yo! Yo, 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 the world may not need another podcast, but it could definitely use a slap. That's right. Welcome to Slap the Power, a show that blends artistry with advocacy. And today is a very, very, very special day for me. Uh, it's kind of part of the reason why I was inspired to kind of set this up and, and do this show and everything. Uh, I'm gifted, blessed today to have not only as our interviewee, but also as a guest host today, uh, I'll give you the, I'll give you, this is a podcast or an audio medium, but for the people that are, uh, you're looking, watching at this on the YouTubes and the visuals, you see this, but for those that are in the audio medium, uh, I'll, I'm going to tease this a sec. He is the voice of character Lester Grimes on the HBO series Vinyl, created by Martin Scorsese and Mick Jagger. I, I've never actually heard of those people, but maybe some people have. He studied drama and music at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, in addition to his work with his first band, Dakota Moon, he was also basically, not even basically, he was also the best contestant on Rockstar in Excess. Uh, his music career has included parts in Broadway musicals, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, Pippin, Songs for a New World, Grease, and We Will Rock You. He's best known as the lead singer of a band you might hear about all the time on this show, Vintage Trouble. He recently released a stunning and original jazz album called the Nouveau Mid-Century Romance Songbook. Uh, he was the best man at my wedding. He's my best friend and all around one of my top human beings, favorite human beings ever on planet Earth. Please welcome the one and only Mr. Ty Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so interesting. Whenever you do a show like this, you assume that, you know, most of the background information came from Wikipedia. So I just... It did. Yeah, I was just paying attention to stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a lot of stuff that's left off. So. No, it's a ton of stuff that no, was left no, off. That was, that, I was, wanted... that was me just saying, like, there's more than what... Yeah, no, show. I know there's a lot more, and we'll, we'll get into it, and that's what I'm, I'm kind of stoked about. I, I wanted to put that out there for people that actually don't know, that might be coming from a from a different angle, and it was... It's obviously, I knew all the, the, the stuff, because you, you're my, my best friend and everything, but the part of the, the reason this platform exists is because uh the opportunity to help people you're the truest artist that, uh, that i know that i've probably ever met as far as uh you just channel things into art always and i feel like we've been blessed because if you help one person with a song and it comes back you realize you know the, the offering to god the work is 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 being done this particular issue um for those of you that uh saw our previous episode uh, Maya and Casey, uh, star of Daz It, Daz All, and Maya, my regular host here, they did part one of a two-part series on something I just actually even sort of found out about. I knew the context of everything, why it, it, this is, but I didn't even know the word adultification. And th this is part two of a two-part series, the, the adultification of black and brown children. And you say, you know, why do I need to hear about this? Why do I need to learn about this? And like a lot of things, awareness or just even being aware of a problem is the first start, right? And that's where I feel of, you know, vehicles like these are particularly effective. And one of my most, in this, in this area, the, in this lane, one of my most sort of transcendent artistic experiences is the last song on the jazz record that you have on hand. And you know, I'll let you kind of get into that, but it 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 is the most truest sense of kind of uh, synthesizing a, a, a concept that is horrific into art and into clearing and catharsis for oneself. 
And that was the reason, probably the main reason why I was inspired to have you as the co-host on this. Maya, they did the girls episode on the girls' perspective on the adultification of black and brown children. And so I appreciate you trusting me and coming on the show to be, uh, you know, co-host on on this with this topic as well. Because mm-hmm. I know it's particularly, it's a it's a sensitive topic. I, I appreciate the girls even putting me here. Why is a, you know, half Cuban white guy, you know, do, you know, why am I talking about this? But I believe that's what makes it even more potentially powerful, is that there's not only data. But it's great to hear from somebody that's kind of lived this. And you might say to yourself, what is adultification? What does that even mean, right? And why do I need to care about it? And it's, it is basically our children growing up way faster than, than they need to. And the reality is, uh, and Maya kind of quoted this in the first one, you know, a lot of teens are in a hurry to grow up. I was in a hurry to grow up. Were you in a hurry to grow up when you were a little kid? Did you want to be like, did you want your driver's license and shit like that? Like, I didn't. You didn't? No, I mean, because I, I don't know, maybe as a kid, maybe because I started performing when I was so young, I was always surrounded by adults. So I sp- basically spent my life living in an adult world. My siblings were all 10 years at least older than me. And so I never really thought about wanting to be older because, I mean, besides driving, and I wasn't really that excited to drive. I just have nightmares about driving, so I wasn't really thinking about wanting to drive. No, what were the uh, night, nightmares about driving? Just, just, just always being behind the, the wheel of wheel. a car. Yeah, and obviously, you know, I'd already had sex by the time I was eight. Sure. Old, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> no, I mean, but I literally had, so that's different. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, fair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Charlie Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's good to laugh about that. Yeah. Um. No, I didn't think about. I didn't think about growing up fast. The, but I know most people do. Yeah, and and like a lot of people, I was I was sort of shook because I realized an extension of slavery. My, like a lot of people, uh, Ava DuVernay's documentary, uh, you know, Thirteen, kind of laid out how okay, well, when uh, the uh, when slavery ended, when Emancipation Proclamation came, and then Reconstruction and everything, the next move was to incarcerate people because that's basically a, that's the way that we now modern day slavery is incarceration and our incarceration rates are, you know, through the roof and things like that. But how often do people that aren't of color concentrate on the realities of how the black and brown family and, and, and people of color, how the, that family has sort of been systemically eroded. Right. Well, I think the, the, one of the really quick things is that on the surface, it might seem like, and this is not me, obviously, saying anything um, negative about, you know, Ava's presentation. But incarceration, yes, is the next stage. But then what about all the stages that aren't seen? Like if you talk about the five senses and there's a sixth sense that's just kind of flying in the air and these kind of things, yeah. um, you know, 99% of what we are experiencing, we don't see. We don't see so yeah. I'm not, I don't, I personally don't think incarceration was the next step because there's so many types of slavery that African Americans live all day long on the streets that people are unaware of why it's happening. So there's a slavery according to old slavery that doesn't have to do with being behind a person. So that's my thought about it. Yeah, no, well, that's, yeah, fair point. And I think, uh, you know, to to kind of piggyback on Maya's information and the stuff that she gave me, but basically there's been a bunch of research that has been released as of late that kind of lays this out in a way that it feels like it's time has come as far as raising this issue because one of the things uh, is it, the study found, and we'll credit this in the show notes and things like that, but um, it was recently published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and it found that African-American boys as young as 10 years old are significantly less likely to be viewed as children than their white peers. It also suggests that it could have serious impl- implications for the way that uh, African-American boys are viewed by the criminal justice system and society as a whole whole. And there's a Georgetown study, which Maya referred to, um, and, and basically uh, it, it, con- it conducted, it shows black male children were consistently singled out as troublemakers and received disciplinary action five times more likely than their non-black counterparts. Black youth are more than four times as likely to be detained or committed to juvenile facilities as their white peers, according to nationwide data in, in 2019. And a couple of states, this has gotten better since this study. It was in 2019, and there's some, there's some, but m- most of them are still shitty and going in, in the wrong direction. And so, to your point, there's a systemic issue. If you have people that are, like you said, there's a different form of slavery if you can't 
you know, if you can't get a job, there's a different form of slavery if you're caught in the system and you're, you know, homeless. And there's a different form. There's all kinds of different forms. Yeah, there's some kind of slavery if you're talked to differently or if, you're, or if you have to question the words you say because you're afraid that it won't get you into not only a university, question the words that you have to say because it won't get you into um, a job. And yeah. also, b- besides the things that were listed before, there's also the idea that a lot of African Americans live in homes where from the time they're seven, their fathers say to them, you know, be a man. Yeah, yeah. So even um, the things that are caught inside of the homes and taught inside of the homes are going to make some of these kids, things that don't seem like they're bad things to say, man up. Yeah, You know, sure. In, I don't think in many white homes a kid falls, hits his head on a, on a tree, comes home crying, and their father's going to say, man up. Man up. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. there's that. Or, or do, you want, do you want me to give you something to cry for? You know? Yeah. So they're all there. Although they're, my they're, dad gave, right. me, gave me that shit. Right, that's for right. sure. There's, Shout there's, out to Chief. Yeah. But yeah. It's, so there's that kind of thing that makes people grow up. And then only because uh, the statistics, statistics are higher for African Americans with separating, like, you know, being single parent homes. Yes. Yeah. So then obviously. Th- the guy, the, the seven-year-old guy at home with his mom, he actually is the man of the house. And that's what I was, why I was bringing up the incarceration point earlier is because the, the sort of systemic mission was to just remove the male figure out of the center of the house, right? And so what is, and then that way you can erode the black family. Any way you can incarcerate them means that they can't vote. And if you can pull their vote out, you can steal elections, which, you know, they've been doing from, you know, for, for a long time with respect to gerrymandering and just manipulating the political system to where minority rule still happens. Um, and it's basically because of a system that's sort of holding... By a- gerrymandering, do you mean nigger rigging? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, that's where it comes from. I mean, yeah. they've changed gerry- gerrymandering was not a phrase. Yeah, right. It's in the West- Webster's yeah, Dictionary yeah. now is like yeah, this technical thing. Right, they, they've we- taken it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, the reason why I, I was also so interested to talk about this this issue with you is because we've spent we spent so much time together and we we've seen um, you know different parts of the world that sort of kind of treat this situation differently. But it seems in America, you know, our, our, the original sin is still part of the problem, and it is um, it's. It, I, one of the things I want to do is try to figure out, well, how, first of all, like I said, make, raise the awareness. And then second of all, how can people help? Right. And how can, how can, um, you know, I, I, a lot of people who know me knows I, 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 you know, I also grew up around black family and there was no father figure there, you know, and, uh, there was a lot of, uh, in, in a primarily black neighborhood, um, it, actually, it was all black neighborhood. There was most of the most of the families that I would play with and play with my friends in that neighborhood did not have a black uh, a male father. role model in the in the household. And it really it never clicked with me because m- my mom and dad divorced when I was very young. So I just kind of you get into you think it's a, into a the click where oh, okay you know you don't you can take advantage of your mom right it's, if you want to be a little mischievous. <clears throat> teenager that's a that's kind of a good thing i never actually looked at it as a bad thing until you start to realize you ha- you have kids or you have friends that have kids and you realize how important the balance of everything is was there a point that you realized that um was there a point that you sort of realized around your neighborhood that any uh, you know i know you also grew up in montclair which is a slightly different yeah i didn't i wasn't around single family <laughs> yeah 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 single but parent did did you have a did you where was your first experience where you kind of felt like you were sort of singled out by the police for example did you have an experience where you were like i didn't no no i mean i i which is the problem only because it was probably happening you know all around in in the black neighborhoods <laughs> No, but I, I say no, that. Sure, no, sure. I say that. Say, you know, I did grow up in a in a in, in a neighborhood where it was mixed, but it was at a different um, financial home status yeah. level. You know, yeah. And so, th- I didn't think about it a lot when I got older. I actually w- was teased because I seemed like I was growing. They, a lot of the people that looked like me assumed that. Um, that I didn't like them because I acted like the people that were unaffected by being pointed out. You know, mm-hmm. I, I would, people didn't look at me and, and think that I was trouble. I just didn't have one of those, you know, it, I didn't put out that kind of energy. And 
it's kind of affected me a lot as I've gotten older. Like, so a lot of this adultification you're talking about, I guess I just skipped over a lot of the stuff that would make it apparent in me. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, when the whole George Floyd thing went down, I'm the friend that everyone came to, Mm. to ask, you know, for forgiveness, you know, for the way, you know, white people have treated black people over time, the way, um, white people, white kids, uh, uh, how they, you know, would tease black kids. You know, mm-hmm. I would, I would, they were all coming to me to apologize, but they were only coming to me to apologize because I was the safe choice. Because I was the one that, you know, that seemed, they didn't do this consciously, but they were coming to me because I seemed like the African, African American that was least affected by being black. Mm. And so it was easy for them to come to me because I wasn't going to lean into them about the stuff they hadn't done. I was going to speak to them in the way that they were used to being spoken to. And it would have felt great. It would have felt like a nice, evenly leveled, balanced, great communicated therapeutic session. Yeah. So they came to me because it was going to be easy. Yeah. Um, When I look back at it now, now that I've been doing a lot more studying about the things that I kind of glazed over because I was either in a better neighborhood or because I didn't want to seem like people that were acting meaner than me. You know, yeah, yeah, so I missed it. But now that I've been studying a lot of it, I realize more and more every day about the problems that African Americans have as we get older. And it's really, um, now I can't watch anything that reminds me about all of the judgment that I had mm. toward other African Americans that seemed to be carrying the seed of the situation that we were in with them. People that were carrying the seed of slavery every day mm. because it hadn't still been fully dealt with. I used to look down on that energy only because I, I was thinking about the things I were taught, things about good manners, the things about how to speak to people, the way to communicate perfectly when you're in a job situation, the way that you're supposed to talk when you're doing a college interview. Um, when I was in school, even, I, you know, we had, you know, the points of, of, of great speech. So I was even told I was saying my last name incorrectly my entire life. You know, I was saying Ty Taylor. And he was like, no, you're Ty Taylor. And so they corrected my name for me. So all this kind of stuff. So I was cont- for for don't for people that kind of don't understand that. Explain that, like like the the, the well in phonetics. There's a way. To, there's bef- when I was in college, there hadn't been an, an abonics talk yet. Okay. We hadn't been the abonics dictionary. They hadn't talked about um, regionalisms. Actually, they separate us sometimes in great ways, just like an accent. Like we love a good Southern accent sometimes, hey. but not if it's a Southern accent that lifts us, you know, right. thing up and wants to put the R at the end of that N word. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good accent, I, no, no. but um, there, there are lots of points of speech that we learn. And so basically what those points of speech are, is it's kind of homogenizing us to um, look like we look, mm. but speak like, uh, white people, and then so that makes us seem like the ha- the, the house in words. Yeah, and so I basically had been living my life like a house nigger, <laughs> and and it's been hard for me. And I feel, you know, I do therapy, so it's like you know, don't feel guilty. I feel guilty, um, but g- guilty in the way that I deal with it every day. So I'm trying to get rid of the guilt by doing the work, um, and until I do the work, it wouldn't be fair of me to not feel guilty because. I've never done anything physically to anyone, but I've had a lot of of judgment in my mind. And I even, I've gone through periods where I'll even separate different parties and different friends because I knew not to ask this person not to be a certain way, but I didn't want to put them in the same room with another person that I would then have to juggle mm-hmm. about the, 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 tie, the tie that's pretending to be white. Mm-hmm. And the tie that is black, you put these people in the same room, they're gonna go at it, and I'm gonna have to stand in the in the middle of them like fucking Switzerland. Yeah. And and both sides feel like I'm betraying them. So my adultification, it actually has to do with becoming more black. Which, which is fascinating to me as well. I, I, and I I love it. And as your as your friend, I you've always been an inspiration in general uh, to so many people but I, I i love the blossom i love the i love the even yeah, more empowerment and i uh it was it's funny <clears throat> i'm i'm going to put the uh, link in the show notes but there i was talking to Bree the other day about how you um on stage anytime i've ever seen you with another artist you always go up to the line you know, but you won't pass the artist, right? You but you you get you get you you'll put it right up there, and I know you, and I'm like, okay, that's Ty at ninety percent, but that's class that he's leaving that ten percent for them, you know, on the stage. It's a 
fucking bananas performance. I saw it yesterday. It made me cry. I wanted to call you right at the time it was going. I was like, no, I'm going to save it for the show. Um, because it was the, we, it was the, I, I guess I could say the artist. It was with Joss Stone and the knock on wood. And I, and, and I was like, I was showing our associate producer, Bree, this, and I was like, you just got to see this because it's a, it's a master class in almost how you played to the, it's, it's like you played to the, the, the frame that's around that, that is still looking back at it now, it's less than the frame that you are, right? You, you just stopped at where that person's. You, a kind of stature is right. and everything. Not no props to Josh Stone. He's fucking amazing, and and the whole performance is it's uh, kind of live. But it when you came out, it it it's a such class that you would leave that space for other people to to be themselves. But now looking at you, you know, seven years later, ten years later, or whatever. It's, it's, you know, it's a beast. And that guy was a beast in that video. Right. You know, this is a different kind of beast where you are right. now. And so it's but a, then it's, when you kind of partner with something like that, I always think that it would have been a worse performance had, had, had I had tried to do everything I could do. Right. Because then it becomes about someone trying to outdo someone or someone or someone being insecure enough, being right. so insecure they're going to try and outdo someone. Yeah. So the second you step on stage with two featured people, um, it's about collaboration and the second that one steps over that to me like you know how to have those verses things like sometimes if people are singing together you're comparing whatever sure the second you step over it you lose yes you know what i mean well said because because then again if you have more then you should treat it like a um a pressure cooker and mm -hmm. then you get to give as much as you have people feel it but they know that you're keeping it going yeah. wild at a certain peak. Yeah. You know, you're not just being boring or yeah. doing less of yourself. You're doing the same amount of yourself in a smaller container. Yeah. I had an, a, a moment as a kid, you, you're, you, you're aware of this, and where I was, it was right before my 21st birthday. It was about, about I want to say, a week before, and I was out hammered, just, just being done. It's like, how were you drinking when you weren't 21 yet? This is a sidebar. We were at a Hooters uh, Christmas party. If, uh, But... The, the funny thing is I, we had done some uh, drugs in the bathroom. We had gone out and smoked a joint. We had, we had, I was already drinking a bunch of Long Island iced teas. And, you know, the drugs that we, I had taken at the time was, was, uh, was, you know, some hallucinogenics. And I had no business behind a wheel. I, I had no business behind a wheel. But we had a place where we had a kind of an after party set up that was a couple of miles away from where the party was. And I was driving to that. I went the wrong way down a one-way street. I got pulled over by the cops. I had an ounce of weed <laughs> in the dash. Like, and uh, I, you know, I, they handcuffed me, put me in the back of the car, but then walked me to where the the, the party was. And basically they let me go. And I, I remember I was coming on my, my acid trip and I remember coming through the door and being like, they, they were like, don't ever fucking do this again. Don't ever let us see you do this again. And this is a, this is a Morning. early birthday present from the Tampa police department. Right. And I, the, you know, it was, it shook me to the core and everything. But that wasn't even something until George Floyd and some of the conversations you and I had after that to where I actually got a chance to sort of go back to that moment and realize if I would have gone to jail in that moment, my life would have changed. I was, you know, and you don't get out of the system. And if my face would have looked, uh, um, you know, a, a different color than it did, uh, I probably, I would have been arrested, you right. know, especially in Florida there. And it, uh, it, it's something, did you ever have, what's your first experience? You know, you're, you're lucky, but did you, where was the first place where you kind of felt a different, you know, Chris Rock has this thing where even when he's, he's driving anywhere, he's like, even though he's Chris Rock, it's, it's fucking, if he's driving in a red mm -hmm. state or something like that, he's on full alert. Right. Did you ever have like a moment where you were like, oh, uh, my, f my white friends or whatever are, are treated differently than, you know, by the police. Yeah. Um, but I guess my guess would be that those stories are told enough. So I think in a way to deliver a unique kind of story for me, I was the one, if I'm with my black friends and we get stopped, I'm pushed forward to be to the, be the that person talks. that speaks. Yeah. You know, we, you and I even have a mutual friend, um, you know, he, he and his brother and myself, we were coming out of, um, Seventh Vale Strip Club. 
And, you know, as we do, he, he got stopped and thrown against the wall. And, you know, he was demeaned. And I had to speak to the cops. And this guy is one of the toughest people I know, one of the biggest guys I know. Um, he's hands up against the wall, pants pulled down, them searching him. We weren't doing anything, by the way. And, you know, and because of the fact that, you know, again, in quotes, you know, I might have that HN kind of personality. If you yeah. haven't been paying attention or if you just jumped on, that means house nigga. <laughs> Um, because I was in that kind of category, I knew what to say. I knew how to get the cops mm -hmm. out of it. And I, you think that I speak correctly regularly. When I started speaking to those cops, I didn't speak correctly. I spoke white. Oh, word. Yeah. And yeah. so I was giving them all that. But I've experienced it. I mean, I've experienced it. Besides that, you know, my father was incarcerated when he was, when I was young. And it's because he was, because for a reason that he stood up for my mom and you know, because my mom was being harassed. I mean, not really harassed, literally just whistled at. And my dad, it, that hurt my dad's pride so much that he beat someone to almost a pulp. No, to a pulp, but there was still a heartbeat, so it wasn't murder. And so, um, again, he was defending his wife. If a white person was defending their wife, it would be, you know, defending someone's honor. And, you know, let's talk about that. And no, you don't have to go to jail. So I have had experiences like that. I mean, we oh, no, no, I just remembered one. When I was seven, no, when I was 11 years old, I used to go to, I was already doing commercials and stuff, and I live in Montclair, New Jersey, but I would take the bus by myself to New York City. So I had to go to New York City for a costume fitting for a commercial. Um, I think it was like Capri Sun or something. Hey. And and I was walking down the street, and I got th thrown in the back of like a, the paddy wagon with all the kids that were playing hooky. So... I got thrown in, obviously, because I'm black. Yeah. I was like, don't you see this Izod Lacoste shirt I've got on? You know, this pink Izod Lacoste, these tan chinos and these plain lovers. Like, I'm not cutting school. I got stopped. Right, but they didn't look past my neck. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they threw me in the paddy wagon. Of course, I get thrown in the paddy wagon, and it's only other black kids. So mm -hmm. when I get inside that van, they know I'm white. Uh -huh. yeah, the yeah. black kids. Yeah. So then I'm in the back of this paddy wagon, and they're ripping into me. And of course, you know, they're calling me, you know, faggot and white and, oh, look at you, because I'm literally crying. Yeah. And uh, I'm in the back of this thing and I'm thinking like, you know, I can't say to these people I'm filming a commercial. So I'm just keeping my mouth quiet. The police precinct, we go there and they call my school and they find out that I'm not. Um, Black. And then they, they, did, they found out that I wasn't uh, playing hooky. Yeah. And then he just let me out of the precinct. They didn't take me back to where I was. This, they didn't take me to take the 11 year old back to where they picked him up. But again, if that was a situation where a police would have taken care of, you know, rep, was trying to reprimand any white kid, mm -hmm. it found out that they were not correct. Mm -hmm. They were in the wrong. That they would make sure that their parents wouldn't have heard that the, that the police let them go at the police station. That kid would have been brought back, if not to where they picked him up, where he was going to. Yeah, you know what I mean? For so sure. They, they just sure. let me out on the street. Yeah. And, um, and so that was a, a situation where I definitely knew uh, being black was making me feel different. But as an adult, I didn't think about it that much. It's funny. We have this. We have the same story, and the uh, the result is exactly as you say. One of my earliest memories was a guy hitting on my mom. My mom's Cuban. And uh, you know, younger, like it was a, it was a, it was a Cuban restaurant we were in, and you know, my dad wasn't having it and assaulted a guy, you know, and uh, you know, I, I, it's, it was definitely a different, it's a different situation. If he would have been, if my dad would have been black, I'm sure he, he would have been incarcerated like, right. like your dad was, and you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we're here, we are in, you know, the 2023 about to be going into 24 and it it still you know what i kind of ask myself like what can be done you know uh, other than trying to figure out where are the role models right in the communities where it has become you know sports figures and things like that and so you have great great uh models like your lebron james and you know you can go down the list and and but <clears throat> in places where you know, well, I, I take that back. They they throw their money around. Oprah throws her money around to help people and things like that. Same with LeBron and stuff. But where are the sort of civic leaders? Because when it came up 
uh, you know, sort of before we were born, they would just kill the civic leaders, right? They would just get them out of the way, the ones that would sh- mm-hmm. kind of show the way on how to sort of rebuild the family structure in, in black and brown communities. And that's the place where I feel like it's an, it's a, it's an economic issue as much as it is, uh, you know, sort of cultural or anything else. But, uh, you know, I do believe, and we've, we've lived it and you've, you've shown it to me, art can be one of those ways that can kind of see through in a, in a way that is, that is empowering. And, um, you know, one of the areas that is was new to me was the hypersexualization of um, black and brown women. Now, growing up in like a primarily or, or around a Latin neighborhood, it, it was kind of the same thing with the women. I remember the girls would just be so early, would be pregnant so early. And then when we moved to t- Tampa or when we got set in Tampa, you realize that that was t- we were in more of a suburb environment and it was a lot less. But the hypersexuality of the children feels like do you do you think that's an extension of not having the a father figure there or a prime, or a, a strong family unit or is it just sort of the culture and the way that our that our you know advertising and things like that are now I mean well, I, don't, I haven't done a statistics search about it but I mean, I would guess it's a lot of different things. I don't know what it's where it lies as far as you know, looking at a graph about it. But I sure. know a lot of times it's also because of, of of social media now. So yes, it could be a home thing. But anytime a kid turns on their computer, yeah, exactly. you know, they're gonna they're gonna especially women, mm-hmm. girls at that time, they're gonna see, they're gonna dream about how life could be as they get older. And if there's a if there's a makeup shop. If there's a bra shop, if there's a way to wear a tighter skirt, they're going to see that and they're going to try and go to that shop or that store and emulate it. You know, like we, we watch so often those movies like with, or TV shows where the woman comes down the steps or the girl comes down the steps and the father's like, no, you're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I, it, but in real life, uh, you know, I think what really happens is most kids are smart enough. To, they're not going to come down the steps like that. Yeah. They're going to have something in their bag. Yep. Yeah. They're going to do that change when they get out of the door. So there's no way to really stop them from doing it. Um, and now, of course, the difference is uh, kids get to watch porno. Yeah. Um, it used to be that you couldn't find it. You can find it everywhere on the Internet. So uh, the women and the guys and everything in between, the women and the guys, you're going you're gonna to try and get to whatever is going to make you feel the most adult or seeming like, you know, people will want you. They they hit you, on this on the sooner. on the other episode on on like the situation with like back, how it back used to be with Jerry Lee Lewis or Elvis marrying you know a six, fifteen year old sixteen year old or R. Mary and, Mary and Joseph Mary <laughs> there you go really going yeah, back that, OG that's, that's the whole thing you know thir- thirteen and forty two hey hey but uh, or R Kelly on how it was like you know and and the the trope that it kind of threw around was well well women back then or even even now there there was a you know why wouldn't they want to be with an older guy and stuff like that and that's just awful it's it's really awful especially now because of so much pressure that's placed i think that there there's a strong statistic i i saw which basically it's it's hockey sticks on the invention of the front facing camera and instagram uh made the rise in female teen suicides just go shoot through the roof right and Mm -hmm. it's because of this this sort of the perception of the self-image you know and we we have dear friends that have kids that are in that age range that are dealing with it all the time and stuff and you know i i kind of feel like um as we do what we do and 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 everything do it was there ever a time uh, you don't have to get into anything you don't want to get into but i know you know that when you do you remember sort of feeling hyper sexualized as a kid because you were you had sass or you had style or you kind of you know you are you were you were badass from a very very you know you're badass out the gate your middle name's Nazareth right mm-hmm. Ty you know but uh you were and do you have a hyper sexualized moment where you realize that oh or if and it wasn't you was it you know around you where you were like oh these that it was you right. know well, again, there are all these things that go on, that go, you know, uh, when people talk about subjects like this, you know, you think about, like, did, you don't have to be Jodie Foster against a, a, a wall, arcade game in a yeah. short skirt to be sexualized. I don't have that moment of 
doing anything to have anyone be attracted to me and think that it'd be cool. But just that's just people's personalities. A pred- predators are gonna be predators. Hey, yeah, no. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was just really about proximity. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. Like right. it's just you know who's the closest to the horniest person. <laughs> You know, their eyes sure. are closed. Their eyes are closed. They're just reaching over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just any, yeah. Um, and so, it, yeah, storm. It's, it's like it's not. I mean, yes, you can sexualize uh, yourself as a kid just because you're excited about a celebrity that maybe you want to be like. So you dress a certain way, and then maybe that's going to lure people on. But that's going to lure in, you know, the punks. Yeah, it's going to lure in the yeah, the, yeah. the amateurs. Yeah, the professionals. Are are the ones that are going to be like it's good, like the priest that's going to lure in the person that's not dressed sexually. They're in church. They're, they're, they're that the kid. They're they're so advanced that kind of predator. Yeah. That it's not about being sexualized. They're going to go with the person that seems the least sexualized mm. because for them, that's a good point. That's that's clean. That's that's blank canvas. Yeah. Right. You that's know. That's like that's that's the that's whatever their demonic mind thinks. It gets off more mm. on something that is, you know, pure snow. Yeah, fertile soil. No, not fertile soil. Yeah, f- dry, flat soil. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there. because you're right. It, it's um, which is which is crazy. So for me, my you know, again, it wasn't about being some young kid that was exciting and sassy because I was still shy. I was still the smallest kid in the, in the classroom, and even though I was already a professional actor. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't wear that around, you know, mm-hmm. when I was around, I had to, to not be that way in order to not get beat up by the people that were bigger than me and tougher than me. That would be insecure by the fact that I was making dollars already. Yeah. You know, they, you know, they're going to find a way to be mad. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not going to find a way to be mad. They're already mad. They're going to find a way to torture you. So I, I didn't flaunt mine at all. So, you know. I was kind of like prime. Yeah, yeah. For if, if there's a predator around, you know, I'm I'm the one they gonna find. Yeah, because I'm the one that seems like an angel. Mm. And for them, it's 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 sexier to destroy an angel than it is to destroy a little devil. Yeah, yeah. No, fair point. That fair point. I, you know, I, the song on hand and every every time I I see it, I, I have I I have a lot of trouble even just. Just because you mean so much to me, and uh, it's 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 always even hard to go through. And at the same time, I know you use that as catharsis. And so, you know, we're gonna put a link to the record and let and, and inside the show notes and and stuff. That way, people can kind of check it out on their own. But I, you know, I applaud you on your way uh, on on the journey as far as how you synthesize things into into productive and creative and positive, you know, things. Mm-hmm. And, again, uh, again, because maybe this is. A unique perspective on it. My superpower of being able to synthesize and um, to see the cup as half empty rather than no, it's half full rather than half empty. It is a huge. It's been a huge thing for me because it's it's allowed me to be successful early. It's allowed me to be surrounded by great people. It's allowed me to be the kind of person that, that can be optimistic and and spread that and teach that and mm-hmm. radiate that. But also at the same time, the fact that I haven't carried some of the anger from some of the things that I had as a kid, um, it's made me feel a little bit like ignorance is bliss. Mm-hmm. Like maybe so much of my joy and so much of my um, unique optimistic Mm. energy is because I've blocked something out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to, do you think that's a, I actually, I'm, I'm actually appreciating the ability to do that nowadays in a way that is not, not, Oh no, no, I'm paying attention to something that doesn't need to be paid attention to, but I'm not letting an energy in at a time that I'm not fully prepared. How to, Mm, I think it's different as we get older opposed to during your formative years, Mm, because if it happens during your formative years, then you know, like you, you just sweep stuff under a carpet. Yeah. Um, emotionally and uh, mentally. Yeah. So yes, in my life now, I do that. Yeah. I almost didn't even come because I'm already tired of dealing with you. <laughs> no, no, but like in my life, I do that. But yeah. that's now. Yeah. Um, back then, I, you know, no, I see. I what I want to say is I, I can't think of it as a negative thing. I just know that it happened. Sure. Because without it, I might not be in California. I might not be sitting behind this mic right now. I might not, you know, look like this. (laughs) No, but all those things that have brought me to I am, I don't want to say that, um, I want to poo poo the idea that I've been an endurer. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or, and uh, and my resilience is like a trampoline. Yeah. But 
I think it's made me miss some important things. And I'm glad that I have an awareness right now in my life that I don't even, I'm not even angry at myself. I said I feel guilt, but I don't feel angry at myself. Um, I just know that I don't have a whole lot of life to live, not double the life that I've lived. So I'm more eager to get the real answers. So yeah. it doesn't make me upset or angry. It makes me um, eager. You know, I chomp at the bits to find the information that I've been negating all my life and figure out how to use that now. And so everything feels new to me. The way I choose clothes, the colors, I, the fact that I want to wear as many colors as possible, the idea that I can sing differently, the idea that, you know, uh, that I can write differently, that I can sing songs, like the meaning of songs that I've sung all my life, they mean something different now. Like, you know, I was, I'm Saturday, I'm singing Respect for something. And just the idea, when you read the lyrics and sing the lyrics, it all means something different to me as the person that's choosing to dive in to the hurt that comes in the adultification of African Americans. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful. And thank you again for, for trusting me here. And anyone... Um, you know, another part of this is you're not alone. And Maya and I, when we talked about this, and Maya, you know, brought this this the idea for these two shows to me. Um, we wanted to make sure that people know they're they're not alone. And and you brought up a great point about how your formative years are a lot. To, everything is you know sort of happening to you, and as you get older, you realize everything's happening for me, mm -hmm. and the difference. And so for, uh, for, you know, anyone, anyone that kind of feels lost out there, we, you know, the, we're, we're going to put the information for the Boys and Girls Club of America and for the Los Angeles Urban League, both of which are sort of resources on ways that, um, you know, can help people in inner cities and people of color, uh, children of color and things like that. And, um, you know, before we get out of here, just to kind of lighten it up as well, I like, and this is all, this is interesting to me because it's a dumb game, but it's really cool. You pick two cards, you get to, an you have to answer one of them though. That's okay. But game. why don't we answer it okay. under the, um, <laughs> under the umbrella and, um, and of, of, of somebody African, else? No, of African American adultification. Okay, I love it. Like so. <laughs> so, I, I, am I now? Am I the Just, it's patriarch? Gotta, you got to matriarch. You have here. to answer it honestly and include adultification adult, in it. Adultification. I love this. I love this. Okay, so go ahead. P choose one. Uh, as an African American, I'm you can't. You, choose so you, first. you can pass. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. So it doesn't okay, feel like okay, you're giving me an order. Great. So this one is: Do <laughs> do you let little things get in the way of the big things? That's that's a that's a. That's a softball. I feel like that one's too easy. I'm no, gonna, it's I'm, not. Yeah, because you right. got it. Has to do with adultification. All right, cool. So the way the way that you that I do not let the little things get in the way of the big things is uh, is don't grow up too fast, right? Don't is because you need to give yourself time to figure things out. And I slow down, I'll slow You're down, moving too fast. fast. Yeah, yeah, feeling You're, groovy. <laughs> the Indie Irie, that one, no, that, uh, no, that happened to be Simon Garfunkel. Oh, oh, there's the Indie Irie one too. Which is, slow down, baby. You're going too fast. Anyway, she, well, she just ripped them off. Yeah, it did. She might have. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> we should look back on. But as as the <laughs> she's taking it back goes, from all the stuff the white people took from black people. Hey, hey, you know, do what you got to do. But um, so yeah, I would say don't. I don't anymore. Uh, I work really hard not to let any kind of the small things get in the way of the big things, and that's because uh, I don't. Uh, I learned from the adultification of other kids, and, <laughs> and I don't want to be that. So. Okay, perfect. My question is, what do you have about... Oh, first of all, there's no question about this. I need my glasses. What do you love about your hometown? <laughs> oh, that's... Yeah, that's okay. softball. As, a, as, a, as an adultification from, from right. a perspective, yeah. Yes. I do this, right? Yeah. Then keep it done. Can we can just keep okay. it down? Keep it down. <laughs> okay. So let me see. What do I love about my hometown? Um, what I've learned is because of my hometown, it saved me from a lot of the heaviness that a lot of African-Americans go through in the process of adultification. But what I, I love it for that reason, but it's a love-hate relationship because I also hate the fact that it um, visored a lot of the things that if I had seen them shining as bright as they did, I might have dealt with some of the things I'm dealing with right now a lot sooner. Mm, fair, fair. Mr. Ty Taylor, thank you so much for, for coming down. Thank you for, for being here. It's, um, it is, it is, and thank you for trusting me around this topic. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, all the future synthesis that is to come in, in sort of taking these things and weaving them into good for people and continue to do it. So thank you again for being here. Thank you. Yeah. 
Slap the Power is written and produced by Rick Barrio Dill and Maya Sykes. Associate producer, Bree Corey. Audio and visual engineering and studio facilities provided by Slap Studios LA with distribution through our collective home for social progress in art, Slap the Network. If you have any ideas for a show you want to hear or see, or if you would like to be a guest artist on our show, please email us at info at slapthepower.com. Yo!